He wanted to fight, and he said, I'm not signing shit. If I can't prove I'm innocent, then I'm going to die in here. Nearly 15 years ago, 16-year-old Arthur Carmona was heading over to a friend's house to play video games when he was stopped at gunpoint by the police. Within seconds, like a dozen cars, cops jumping out of the car at gunpoint. They handcuffed Arthur. They started bringing people by. And they had him stand up, look to the side. People were nodding no. The police had suspected Arthur of robbing a nearby juice bar. Arthur's mom, Ronnie Sandoval, later found out about video surveillance showing the robber wearing a baseball hat, a hat that didn't belong to her son. Another cop comes. She pulls out a black Lakers baseball cap, and they try to force it on Arthur. And he's, you know, like, what are you doing? That's not my hat. God, cops tell him, well, if you move, we're going to shoot you. They force the cap on his head, and people start coming by again. Same thing. No, no. None of the witnesses ever ID'd Arthur. The one person that ID'd him was um, the cashier, and he ID'd the hat. Next thing we know, they're charging my son with 12 armed robberies. Every case that we look at is different. Uh, but there are common elements. There are things that kind of that seem to transcend them. Rob Borden of Northwestern Center on Wrongful Convictions has helped piece together the National Registry of Exonerations, which documents over a thousand people who have been exonerated in the U.S. Our great hope for the registry is providing data uh, that will lead to, uh, that will fortify arguments for reform. The registry was released earlier this year and has shined a spotlight on the many systemic problems with the justice system that leads to wrongful convictions, like flawed eyewitness testimony that's highlighted in Arthur's case. Uh, the number one cause of wrongful convictions uh, clearly is uh, eyewitness error. We know that we can reduce the number of erroneous eyewitness identifications if we vary the process by which uh, uh, the police conduct uh, uh, lineups. Instead of having people stand in a row like you've seen countless times on television, uh, if you do it first of all with photographs and you present them sequentially rather than in an array, that eliminates the tendency to make a relative judgment. That is to pick the person in the group who most resembles uh, the perpetrator if the perpetrator perpetrator doesn't happen to be there. Another huge problem is false confessions, which factor into roughly half of the cases that Warden has looked at in Illinois alone. This is the single factor that, uh, that people have the hardest time wrapping their mind around. It's possible for the police literally to brainwash an individual into accepting the proposition that he or she might have committed this crime and blacked it out of their mind and then they will start trying to get you to hypothetically speculate on how the crime might have occurred, and the statements you make are then construed as a confession. The registry includes cases dating back to 1989, when DNA was first successfully used as evidence in an exoneration. A lot of people say, think that DNA is some kind of a panacea, that now that we have DNA, uh, we'll have, we'll, this solves the wrongful conviction problem. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, DNA uh, is available in, o in only a tiny minority of all criminal convictions. Yet Arthur's case had DNA that could have exonerated him from day one, but it was never used during his trial. The person, when he was casing the, the juice bar, he went in and he ordered a juice, a juice cup. So they had his saliva and DNA in that cup. We didn't know about it. So they would have known from the get-go, from the very beginning, if they would have run that DNA, they would have known it wasn't Arthur. How could the police be so negligent? Was it malice, corruption? Uh, one common element that occurs in a lot of cases in which there have been wrongful convictions is a phenomenon we call tunnel vision. That is that some police officer, some detective, gets a theory of the crime and finds some evidence to support that theory. And then, as the investigation progresses, anything else that comes to light that can possibly be construed as corroborating that is so construed. And anything that comes to light that doesn't fit is given short shrift or just basically ignored. And it's not a matter of guilt or innocence. It's a matter of can I get a conviction or not. So nobody's really taking a look at the evidence, at the case itself. 
So once the DA starts that case, whether they're right or wrong, they're not going to stop. Tunnel vision isn't an easy problem to fix, but forcing detectives, officers, and other officials involved to take responsibility for misconduct might be a start. A lot of the statements that were made afterwards basically said that we didn't do anything wrong. The jury wrongfully convicted him. In fact, there's a certain tool the district attorney has that lets an innocent person out of prison but also strips the justice system of responsibility for any wrongdoing. The DA offered to let him go if he signed a stipulation. And the, the stipulation, in short, basically said, I promise not to sue the cities, um, the two cities, the police departments, and in exchange I'll get my freedom. He didn't want to sign it. The U.S. Supreme Court has condoned that procedure. It's called an Alford plea. And it's really kind of a form of torture. Uh, you, you've just fought for years for, to overturn your case. The prosecution is basically dangling a carrot in front of you that, look, here's the key to your cell. You can walk out today. All you have to do is enter, uh, uh, you know, sign this piece of paper. If you don't sign it, uh, we're going to take you back to trial. And who knows, we convicted you once without any evidence. Maybe we'll do it again. He wanted to fight. And he said, I'm not signing shit. If I can't prove I'm innocent, then I'm going to die in here. Well, me, selfish, you know, mother, I wanted my son. I wrote a letter, a note, and I said, sign the paper. Just get out. So he ended up signing it. He was not officially exonerated. That's when I started to realize the damage I did because he needed to be exonerated. You know, it's very difficult to exonerate someone. Um, you know, you find that once you're convicted of the crime, the evidence that it takes to exonerate you is just got to be far greater than the evidence that it took to, to convict you in the first place. No compensation. The felonies followed him. With Arthur finally out of prison, Ronnie was looking forward to making up for lost time with her son. But their time was cut short when Arthur was killed in an unrelated hit and run not long after getting out. His innocence was never legally recognized, and he was never truly freed. I'm disgusted with what they did to my son. It was as simple as him walking out the door to go play video games, and he stepped into the twilight zone, and it followed him for all the days of his life. Exposing these injustices is Warden's greatest hope for reform, and his team will continue to plunge into the cases of the countless more wrongfully convicted still behind bars.